Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. It's been more than a month since Israel began its deadly assault on the Gaza Strip, with homes, hospitals, schools and aid agencies reduced to rubble as the death toll continues to climb. Now a top UN official on human rights has stepped down, blaming the UN for failing to prevent a genocide against the Palestinians and calling the US, UK and much of Europe complicit in the horrific assault. On this episode of Frankly Speaking, we hear from Craig McIver, the former director of the New York office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who has now left his post. We ask him whether his resignation will change anything at the agency, why he says Israel lobbyists are putting pressure on UN leaders, and if anyone can put an end to the massacre. <laughs> Mr. McIver, thank you for joining us on Frankly Speaking. Now, on October 28, you resigned from your post as the director of the New York office of the UN High Commission for Human Rights. Now, in your resignation letter, which has caused quite a stir, you uh, cited the genocide of Palestinian civilians, saying that the US, the UK, and much of Europe is being wholly complicit in this horrific assault. So, frankly speaking, do you think that the stepping down of a renowned figure such as yourself will make an impact or will the UN continue to fail the Palestinian people? Well, Katie, thank you for having me on. Uh, I, I want to be clear first that my critique was not of the entire UN. I stand very much in solidarity with our colleagues on the ground who are humanitarian workers, human rights workers, many dozens of UNRWA colleagues who have been killed by Israeli bombs just in the last few weeks and the people across the UN who are really working because they're committed to the norms and standards of the organization. They're committed to peace and development and, and human rights, but who I have said have been abandoned by the political leadership and the intergovernmental mechanisms inside of the um, United Nations. Uh, and I, I don't know that my stepping down is going to change the United Nations. I'm not that important, but my goal was to try to open up the conversation because I had noticed that over the course of many years, you have seen this trend toward more trepidatious approaches when it comes to Israel and Palestine on the part of the UN, the political side of the house, as, uh, as I say. And I thought it had reached a point where there was such a wide gulf between what we are commanded to do by the international human rights norms and standards on the one hand and the political positioning of the organization on the other. And if that conversation can be opened up, then I feel like that uh, is something is something worthwhile. For example, uh, the hesitancy on the part of uh, the UN officially to talk about apartheid in Israel-Palestine, in spite of the fact that every major international human rights organization, Israeli human rights organization, Palestinian human rights organization, the independent human rights mechanisms of the United Nations have decided that the crime of apartheid is manifest there or as most recently raised by my letter, the question of genocide as defined by UN convention. Well, Mr. McIver, I want to ask you a little bit about your comments on apartheid and the genocide in just a moment. But firstly, you've had quite a bit of criticism from your letter. There has been a number of people who've come out and said this is not a resignation, rather it is a retirement. We've heard that you informed the UN back in March of your plans to retire. So I have to ask, if you were so concerned that the rights of the Palestinian people were not being addressed, that we had not seen a better, quicker solution to to addressing this crisis. Why did you take so long to resign? Well, I mean, first of all, there has been a real disinformation effort out there to try to distort the reasonings and uh, the sequence of events with regard to my departure. Um, and I can understand uh, where there is confusion on that. Uh, one uh, false representation has been that I was somehow forced out of the organization or fired for reasons of conduct. That's entirely false. I've seen that circulated by some lobby groups that are trying to shift the focus onto me rather than onto the substance. And another one was that I, I just left uh, as a matter of course, uh, unrelated to the events in the Middle East. The truth is that this conversation began in March between myself and the High Commissioner 
in the wake of a series of Israeli atrocities on the West Bank, including some military attacks on civilians in the West Bank and the pogroms by Israeli settlers in Hawara. At that point, I was speaking quite publicly about those violations uh, uh, in public and on social media. And the UN was taking a more careful and I thought inappropriately trepidatious uh, approach to those events. And so I, I was speaking particularly forcefully about that publicly, as I have on human rights situations in countries around the world for 32 years. Uh, but what happened in this case was there, was there was an organized campaign by a group of Israeli lobby uh, organizations that decided to target me uh, by uh, smearing me on social media, but also by demarching the UN in an effort to have me punished, in spite of the fact that I'm a UN human rights official whose job it is to speak out on human rights violations. And, um, uh, and that created an atmosphere where there was even more trepidation and an effort on the part of the UN to tell me to be silent on these issues, which was something that I, I clearly could not do. So already in March, as a result of this, I, I wrote and indicated one that I thought that this deference to powerful states, uh, because the critique was coming also from Western countries, uh, and to these lobby groups, was undercutting our principled application of UN norms and standards, and that we needed to stand up against these things and not be intimidated into silence by them. To the contrary, I'd encourage that we should be speaking out more loudly. And of course, there has that. been a, there has been a review that has been taking place. I understand you've said previously you were not aware of this. Uh, the complaints about some of your comments on social media from these uh, pro-Israeli groups. But uh, but let's talk a little bit further about the reaction to your resignation. I'd be interested to hear uh, what the High Commissioner Volker Turk what he's had to say uh, about your resignation and the reaction you've had from other people um, in the industry too. Well, that review that you referred to was, a, was something I had never heard of. I'm not sure whether it actually took place or not. It wouldn't surprise me because I said a part of the reason for these fearful approaches within the UN is that, you know, different from all other country situations, if you speak uh, out on Israeli violations against Palestinians, there's a network of organizations that will file complaints with the UN just as a matter of course. And they've learned that that can help to tamper down a little bit the critiques that, that come out. So I was never aware of it. I was never contacted. Uh, I learned about it in a Guardian article. Uh, apparently, the internal oversight mechanism didn't do anything with it They because how could they? It would be quite extraordinary if they did, uh, given that you know I was a UN human rights official. And secondly, they handed it on to the high commissioner. As far as I know, nothing happened there either. Uh, so, you know, just to be to be clear on that. So um, uh, so I, I indicated of my own free will, my intention to leave the organization because of my frustration with these things. But I really think that I am not the story here and that it is intentional that people are trying to engage in these conversations rather than the substance of the letter. But I will answer your question. The reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. I have received a tidal wave of solidarity and support and expressions uh, of agreement from inside and outside the UN, UN staffers who have been frustrated about the direction of the international community on these issues and who shared uh, the feelings and the positions that were expressed in my letter, but also from outside the organization across the globe. Of course, those are peppered as well with attacks by uh, Israel lobby groups and um, uh, so-called gongos, you know, pro-governmental NGOs that work for impunity for human rights perpetrators a smattering of death threats, uh, all of that sort of thing is to be expected when you speak out on this issue. But we are at a moment in history where silence is complicity. And I think it's important that we all talk about what's happening and look for solutions that can lead to human rights, peace, equality for Christians, Muslims and Jews across historic Israel and Palestine. And that's what I tried to do in my letter. I I'm mean, it is shocking that you face death threats as a result of this letter. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about more of the pressure from some of these groups, because in your resignation letter, you called for the redirecting of UN efforts and resources to the struggle against apartheid, much like in South Africa. And you also said that the UN's doors and specifically the Secretary General's door should be flung wide open to the legions of human rights defenders. And, and I'm going, to, I'm going to quote you here, and stop the unconstrained flow of Israeli lobbyists to the offices of UN leaders. So tell me a little bit more about the influence that these kinds of groups are exerting at the very highest levels of the UN. Well, the truth is that fear creates access, uh, when in fact the way the organization should be working is in solidarity. You know, I'm in New York, where just a few days ago we saw 
principled and committed Jewish human rights and peace defenders take over Grand Central Station in their thousands, 400 of them being arrested uh, out of principle to defend Palestinian human rights, to demand a ceasefire, and to make very clear that what Israel is doing is not in their name. A few days later, we saw the same thing happen with the Statue of Liberty, and we've seen those kinds of demonstrations and pronouncements all around the world. I've said to the High Commissioner and to the UN, all we have to do is follow their lead. Uh, this is, uh, a, a, and, a, and a demonstrators who are standing up at risk of arrest in European capitals and Western capitals and all around the world uh, to demand a ceasefire and respect for the, the human rights of the Palestinian uh, of the Palestinian people. Um, that that is the model that we should be following, not a model of fearing organizations and powerful member states. So, uh, so then trying... tell me about the flip side. Tell me about the uh, the the ability that some of these Israeli lobbyists have in order to put this pressure on the very top uh, leaders within the UN. Well, you know, a lot of these are North American based organizations that have agendas, you know, and there's free speech, they're free to do that, have agendas committed to um, defending Israeli uh, actions, regardless of their violation of, uh, of international law. And these organizations uh, are regularly meet with the Secretary General with I don't want to overemphasize it's not happening on a daily basis, but they regularly have access for meeting with the Secretary General. How regularly? Uh, some of these organizations that actually have UN credentials to participate in intergovernmental mechanisms, even though their sole purpose is to attack human rights defenders and to defend the abuses of a particular member state. It's not the only one. We have these so-called gongos and other country situations around the world. But the level of access that's given to these groups, because they're very much backed up by Western governments, uh, um, is huge compared to the limited access that real human rights defenders have. Um, uh, Jewish human rights defenders, Muslim human rights defenders, Christian human rights defenders, peace activists, uh, international human rights defenders don't have that, that the same level of access. And I think it distorts the vision and the action uh, sometimes inside the UN. But again, I don't want to overstate it. The UN is a big tent. Everybody's voice should be heard there. But it does but sound our, like you're saying they have too much access. What I'm saying is we're a norm based organization and we need to be in solidarity with those who agree with the application of UN human rights standards, not those who are who are fighting for impunity. Their voice can be heard, but we very clearly, as a norm-based organization, are on the side of human rights, on the side of the victim, as Camus said, and not on the side of perpetrators. We engage with all member states, that's a part of our job, uh, but our mission is a human rights, humanitarian law uh, mission. And, and that's where the solidarity should be. And we need to make, uh, you know, we, we, the, the NGO and civil society participation mechanisms of the UN are quite archaic. Access for civil society is limited and constrained in ways that doesn't make sense in the 21st century. And those people fighting for human rights, equality and peace should be given access over others, uh, it seems to me, because they're the ones who are, who are working in solidarity with what it is we're supposed to stand for in the UN. We're not there yet. Okay, well, let's talk a, a little bit more about what's happening in Gaza at the moment, because I noticed in your resignation letter, you did not mention the events of October 7. We saw the horrific attack from Hamas on Israel. Why did you choose to omit such a being such an important event? And what are your views on what happened that day and the subsequent consequences? Well, I didn't mention it because the UN was dealing with it quite confidently and strongly. The UN never hesitates, because my, my letter was a complaint about what we were not doing. And that the UN never hesitates to issue very strong condemnations uh, of acts that are committed by armed groups or by smaller or weaker states. My letter was about how it falls down when it's powerful states uh, that are the ones that are committing or, or complicit in these atrocities. My view, I've repeated over and over again, is that any war crimes committed by Hamas fighters or their commanders in connection with uh, October the 7th must be held accountable under the rule of law. My complaint was that while we've heard a loud chorus in that regard inside the UN and beyond, what you hear much more whispered is uh, the necessity of being you know, morally and legally consistent in saying, in addition to holding those Hamas perpetrators accountable, we equally have to hold accountable Israeli perpetrators of human rights violations, grave breaches of humanitarian law, war crimes, crimes against humanity that happened before October the 7th, and of course, those that have been happening since October the 7th. And if the UN and the international community and all of us are going to be true to the, to the mission of human rights, we have to demand this kind of accountability, regardless of who is the perpetrator and who is the victim. And that's where the international community, many Western states, 
um, uh, and many media outlets are failing. Okay, well, let's talk about some of that accountability when it comes to Israel, because you've used the phrase textbook genocide to characterize Israel's actions in Gaza. Now, we know that genocide is a legal term that is being overly politicized these days. However, international human rights lawyers like yourself certainly don't take this word lightly. So tell me what makes this conflict uncontestably a genocide, because the Secretary General has refused to use that term, but you have said that you are very confident in doing so. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. First of all, I deal with this as a human rights lawyer, and that means that I work from the definition that's contained in international human rights law in the Convention on Genocide of the United Nations, where a very clear definition is laid out together with what the elements are. And there are basically two pieces there. One is intent, to destroy in, in whole or in part a particular group as such. And the other are some specific acts. The specific acts, the catalog of specific acts is beyond dispute. Here we're talking about mass killing. Here we're talking about um, uh, serious harm being caused, including, including physical harm. Here we're talking about um, uh, imposing conditions of life designed to bring out the destruction of the population. Again, beyond dispute, because we're all well aware of the closure and siege of the Gaza Strip over since 2015, which is specifically designed to limit food, medicine, adequate housing, water, sanitation, freedom of movement, all of the conditions of life necessary for, uh, for survival. So that's very clear. But what's really exceptional about this case, Katie, is the fact that you know normally when you're investigating genocide, you have to dig through dusty archives to find records to prove intent. In this case, because of the climate of impunity over several decades, You've got Israeli officials publicly and on the record expressing genocidal intent, including the president, the prime minister, senior cabinet ministers and senior military officials explicitly calling for wiping out all of Gaza, explicitly dehumanizing Palestinians, explicitly calling for no distinction between combatants and non-combatants, and even the prime minister invoking a biblical verse calling for the wiping out of the entire population, sparing none of them, including women, men, children, and suckling babies, as well as their livestock, to quote this biblical ver verse that was invoked uh, by Prime Minister um, Netanyahu. With such clear indications of genocidal intent, with such a long catalog of specifically enumerated uh, actions from the Genocide Convention taking place, and in a context where we've seen successive ethnic purges going back to 1948 with this intent, this is the clearest prima facie case of genocide that we have seen. Now, I do not fault the Secretary General. He is representing an institution. Institutions have to follow particular processes and protocols before they can pronounce on genocide. So the standard refrain is, that's for a court to decide. The problem is that the Genocide Convention is not just about punishment, it requires prevention. And you can't wait for a court to decide that in order to prevent it. So what I'm saying is we need to get comfortable with talking about the crimes as they're defined in international law. And, and also hiding behind a court waiting to recognize that as a legal term. But uh, the response in the Arab world has been a little bit different when it comes to talking about this as a genocide. And uh, in fact, you say that we must recognize that the US and other Western powers are not credible mediators in this conflict, but rather actual parties to the conflict. You say they're complicit with Israel in their violations uh, against the Palestinians. And, and you said that we must must engage in them as such. So tell me, what should the US, the UK be doing right now? How exactly should they be engaged? Well, you don't have to listen to me. You can listen again to the requirements of international law. The US and the UK are parties to these international conventions. They're bound by international humanitarian law, international human rights law, which is clear. First, the Geneva Conventions don't only require that you respect them in your own conduct, they require that all high contracting parties ensure respect vis-a-vis -vis others over whom they have influence, in this case, Israel. Not only have the US and the UK and others not done that, what they needed to do to stop this, but they've actually been actively complicit. The US, for example, in providing financing, arms, intelligence support, diplomatic cover, even the use of the veto in the Security Council, those are direct acts of complicity in breach of their humanitarian law obligations. And by the way, the crime of genocide, as defined in the convention, includes the act of genocide, attempted genocide, incitement to genocide, conspiracy for genocide, and complicity in genocide. So that active support going on, even while these acts are taking place, 
exposes the U.S., the U.K., and, and other states that have been involved so directly to legal liability for their, for their actions. What they should be doing is using all of their influence, diplomatic and otherwise, to stop what's happening, including stop the arming, stop the financing, the intelligence support, the diplomatic cover, so that there is accountability and so that human life can be saved and human dignity can be protected. Uh, and, and I think with enough public pressure, that can be helped. Unfortunately, with a crackdown on human rights defenders and public demonstrations in an attempt to silence those who are defending Palestinian human rights, that is a slow process, but, uh, but it's happening. And we are seeing the public opinion is being, beginning to affect at least the conversation around this situation. But certainly with the veto system in place, it does feel like we are a long way from a ceasefire. But uh, conversely, you have quite an unconventional solution to the conflict. Now, uh, as opposed to most politicians who are calling for a two-state solution, although I know you say in the corridors of the UN that a two-state solution is almost a running joke these days. But you say, and I'm going to quote you here, you say the world must support a single democratic secular state in all of historic Palestine with equal rights for Christians, Muslims and Jews. Now, you must realise this is this proposal is quite a hard sell. I think the only other known politician who has called for it was the late Libyan leader Gaddafi. Well, you, you say it's unconventional. I don't think Gaddafi is the only one who has called for it. There are uh, a lot of public figures around the world have been calling for it for many, many years. Uh, including people from the human rights community who see this as consistent with our standards. It's actually not unconventional. The interesting thing is that in every other situation around the world, the international community calls for solutions based upon equality between all of the people there. Uh, they call for a democratic secular state with equal rights for everybody who is involved in the application of international human rights standards. It's only in this particular situation that there's been a kind of muzzle around this consistency. So it's a very conventional response. It's just that it's been constrained in application in this one case. The reality, Katie, is that there is already one state de facto. The entire area of historic Palestine and Israel is controlled by the Israeli government. Uh, there is nothing left in the West Bank uh, and Gaza for a viable, sustainable Palestinian state as a second uh, state. Even if they were to adopt that, it wouldn't remedy the, the central human rights challenge because Palestinians inside the Green Line still wouldn't have, they'd still be second class citizens, no right to return, so on and so forth. So it never answered that. And the question is, if we demand equality everywhere else, in this case, equal rights for Christians, Muslims and Jews, why do we not demand it in the case of Israel and Palestine? Sure, but, only... but you are effectively calling for the end. You, you are effectively calling for the end of Israel's Jewish state status. That was the uh, the very existential idea that, that founded the state of Israel some 75 years ago. Why on oh. earth would Netanyahu's government agree to a measure like that? Netanyahu's government doesn't even agree with stopping a genocide. I'm not, uh, they are not my audience. What I would say to you is that this is not a call for the end of Israel. This is a call for the salvation of Israel and Palestine. It's a call for the end to apartheid and the end to settler colonialism and the embrace of the norms and standards of the UN that call for democratic, secular states with equal rights for all of the people uh, who are there to be protected. And in every other case, we call for transitional justice mechanisms, uh, protection of civilians, return and compensation for those who have been purged from their uh, from their land. Apartheid itself is an international crime, a crime against humanity, and we can't allow it just to, to continue. So that's why Jews and Christians and Muslims all around the world are now increasingly calling for a single democratic secular Sure, but, but I think that's oversimplifying the situation as well. And given as we see this conflict, I think the idea of being able to resolve it and have equal rights for a number of different uh, ethnicities and, and religions is uh, clearly seems to be further away than ever. But, uh, but I want to say, of course, you are a lawyer who specialises in international human rights law. Uh, you have been investigating the rights of Palestinians since the 1980s. In fact, you lived in Gaza in the 90s. So how do you describe the situation we are seeing today? Because on the one hand, we have pro-Israeli pundits who say the war is justified because it aims to free Gazans from the grip of Hamas, who has taken the entire strip hostage and is using civilians as human shields. But uh, on the other hand, we've got another group saying that the civilians in Gaza, that they deserve to die because they voted Hamas in more than 15 years ago and have refused to overthrow throw them. 
Well, I mean, this is further evidence of the kind of genocidal rhetoric which has gone far beyond government officials and has seeped into the public consciousness as well. And it's the kind of thing we have to address because there's a very real risk when you even have people in the public saying these kinds of things, even commentators uh, in, in the West. Um, look at the reality of the situation. If you talk only about Gaza, you're talking about 2.3 million civilians in a densely populated open air prison. They are literally caged uh, in that area, can't move in, can't move out, are regularly denied adequate food, water, shelter, water, sanitation, um, any of the things necessary for a decent life. As we have said, they are periodically uh, bombed and shot like fish in a barrel. When they try to respond by peaceful means like boycott and divestment, they're accused of being uh, anti-Semites to resist in that way. When they tried with the Great March of Return to have a Gandhi, Martin Luther kind of march uh, peacefully to the wall, they were cut down in their hundreds and shot in their thousands by Israeli snipers, including medics and journalists and peaceful and peaceful protesters. Um, so so the, 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 the status quo that is being defended here, the status quo ante before the October 7th that's being defended, is an unsustainable, atrocious status quo that is in violation of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. So the, the answer to human rights violations is not an exacerbation of human rights violations. The answer to armed resistance and occupation is not increasing the grip of occupation. It is... The, the, the human rights of the Palestinian people denied for 75 years, finally being granted to them, including to people in Gaza, an end to the siege, an end to the occupation, uh, the reconstruction of Gaza. Uh, and, and once again, it's not for me or people in Israel or anyone else to say who should govern the Palestinian people. If we are true to our norms and standards, it's for the Palestinian people to decide who should govern them. But what we have to really be concerned about is this failed paradigm of all of these years that has led only to further dispossession of the Palestinians, persecution, gross violations of human rights, and no peace for Israel either. So I don't think it's unrealistic to start talking about equality and human rights in this context, um, because the status quo has brought nothing but suffering for everyone involved. Tell me about some of the experiences that you had there, uh, meeting people there on the ground. Well, you know, people will be surprised to hear that it's a, it's one of the best places I've ever lived, not because of the conditions on the ground, but because of the people that I met. And, you know, I think this is at the center of the issue that we have today, which is the dehumanization of Palestinians, particularly in the Western mind. These images uh, um, that are portrayed in the media and by politicians that do not capture the reality of the Palestinian people. I think if you are able to look into the eyes of a Palestinian child or woman or man or grandmother or or grandfather, if you're able to, to know them as a people, to see that just like you, they laugh and they cry and they fall in love and they have parties, um, uh, uh, all of the things that your own family does, to see the humanity of the Palestinian people, it becomes impossible to pursue these kinds of genocidal policies that many governments are pursuing. It becomes impossible to dismiss them as the other. They are not the other, they are us, they are you. And once, you know, when you're doing human rights work, if you're at the international level, you feel a lot of solidarity with the people you work with around the world. And I've worked on human rights situations in dozens of countries all around the world. But you actually live in their neighborhoods to see them every day, to see their smiles and their tears and their laughter, to love people from that community, that changes it. And we need a, a heck of a lot more of that, including to know that at this moment, as we're speaking, there are children and women and men buried under rubble their bones broken, their skin burned, very little oxygen in the space they find themselves, dying slow, excruciating deaths as people above try to dig them out with their bare hands. That's what this is. It's not a war on Hamas. This is not numbers and statistics. This is not some barbarous population living in some obscure place of the world. These are human beings. These are you and me. And if we can just get beyond the dehumanization, and start thinking of everyone, Christians, Muslims, and Jews as equal human beings, that's where the solutions are going to be found. Well, let's talk about Israel's role a little bit more in that. I'd be interested to get your thoughts on some of the reports we've seen recently in Israeli media, uh, in fact, that the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has to bear responsibility for propping up Hamas for many years in a bid to undermine the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Do you believe he is to blame for the current crisis? 
Well, I think uh, he he is to blame in legal terms. Uh, I mean, he is the he's the person at the top of the government that's carrying out these abuses. I know there's a lot of disquiet in the Israeli populace with regard to Netanyahu's role uh, in in many respects, including his uh, response in October 7th, including his previous support, as other senior Israeli officials did for Hamas. But, you know, Hamas is an indigenous Gaza. These people were born and raised in Gaza. They grew up in opposition to Israeli occupation. Many of them have never left the cage. They've been born and, and raised inside the cage um, uh, as well. The support, the cynical support that came to them from successive Israeli governments uh, in an effort to create a counterbalance against the secular government of the of the PLO and the PA, uh, certainly he he bears some responsibility for that. But he certainly bears responsibility for the violations that cause Hamas to exist in uh, in in the first place. And I think you know it's clear that uh, their his motives at this moment are clearly not to save the hostages because they're dropping bombs uh, on where the hostages are living. They're, they're clearly not just to battle with Hamas because they're doing a wholesale destruction and slaughter. What's happening in Gaza now is an effort to purge the remaining part of Palestine, that is Gaza, uh, uh, most of it to be bombed to the ground, the rest of it to be rendered unlivable in the hopes, it seems to me, that uh, any surviving Palestinians will then be compelled for survival's sake to leave through the Rafa border and either fade away in the Sinai Peninsula or enter into the Palestinian diaspora, so the takeover of historic Palestine will then be uh, will then be complete. So, uh, um, so it uh, sounds I, like you're saying again, Netanyahu's aim is not to remove Hamas, but is uh, to remove everyday civilians. Uh, it really is that genocide, the textbook genocide you're talking about. So, what well, the figures uh, continue to rise every day. More than ten and a half thousand people have been killed. Important to note, more than four and a half thousand of those are children. Can you foresee any scenario where Netanyahu is brought in front of the ICC to stand trial and be held accountable for some of these crimes? Well, I think you can be sure that in the wake of this conflict, you will see the uh, uh, the, the UN will commission an independent commission of inquiry, as it has after many of these mass atrocities committed by Israel. They will document uh, um, the case. They will prepare evidence for accountability. They may prepare what we call the brown envelope, which is a list of perpetrators who should be pursued in criminal proceedings in a, uh, in a court of law. All of those things will happen, but I think what you can also, and there may be indictments issued in the International Criminal Court or through universal jurisdiction and third party courts that would prevent Netanyahu and others um, who are implicated from traveling. But what you will also see is a full mobilization of the US diplomatic uh, support, uh, that of probably the UK and some European governments to try to prevent accountability, uh, to attack those uh, entities that are trying to hold uh, perpetrators accountable and to under undershore uh, impunity for these these perpetrators. That's what's happened uh, in in previous situations like this. So, I mean, there is a level of accountability. The whole world is watching. People are not being fooled by the suppression of information about what's happening. But legal and and of course the veto in the Security Council stops uh, UN enforcement in that way. Uh, but legal accountability remains on the table because these are crimes of universal jurisdiction. Uh, the evidence is out there uh, and there will be some form of accountability in the future. We should be clear. But uh, thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate your insights and we wish you the best of luck in your future endeavours uh, post the United Nations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the conversation.